Tom's being a wise guy. I can see we, 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 we could do a whole program where people just put up. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I, I have a client who's a teacher. This is remarkable. And I heard that the classroom put together this whole act and she couldn't figure out how they did it, where they would pass a pencil. They were all on Zoom like this. And so like Julia would pass the pencil to, um, to Alan and Alan would pass it to Lori and Lori would pass it to Tom. And she is amazed. How did they figure out how did yeah. like they all got together and they figured out this little trick to play on the teacher. But the teacher said, well, but people change places if somebody gets up or yeah. they're, you know, and how did they work it out in case somebody changed places? I don't know. They, they worked it out, you know, leave it to kids and technology. So we're right. talking today. Well, you you want to say something? <laughs> oh, you're trying to take pass the pen. The pen. <laughs> Look, I pen mean, it's not right. that easy. You know, you all have to have the same pencil. It has it's to look backwards. the same. That's pretty clever. Cool. <laughs> Okay, anyway. No, guys. Okay, let's get let's get real here. <laughs> let's get serious. No, I'm only kidding. So um, so the topic is on innate health and the three principles. And you know what occurred to me is, and I know Alan, you've brought this up about how easy it is to get um uh what would the word be, you know, like it, talking about the principles as a good idea. And this, you know, having innate health as an interesting idea or concept. Well, we want to take it a lot deeper than that. We want to have a look at how do we know that there is such a thing as innate health in all people? What's the clue for you? How do you know that in your life and you know with the people in your life and with yourself mainly because that's who we're most aware of we're in our own head because i wind up apologizing a lot that's the proof to me that i've got innate health because eventually i apologize and that comes from some place other than the uh triggered whatever it was. I'm always, I, as much as it pains me to apologize, I know it's the right thing and I do it, you know, unless, well, I just do it, right? So I guess that's innate, that's my, the proof to me that I have innate health because I always can step back, understand more deeply, have compassion, recognize my own insecurities and apologize. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. You know, I never thought of that. That weird is that ability to all of a sudden, it's like we snap out of whatever we were crunching in our brain, whatever we were angsting about. We, we snap out of it. We realize, oh, wow, I, that was really stupid. <laughs> and you apologize. That's automatic. You know, Except when somebody's still in their ego and they're too embarrassed to apologize. But, you know, most people will snap out of that low mood consciousness enough to know that it would be wise to apologize because I was off base. And what is that inside of we humans that does that, that allows that to happen. Where does that come from? Quiet is good, you know, quiet reflection. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, for me, for me, I'm not sure I know where it comes from, but I know that it's here and I know that it's, it's you can count on it 100 percent. 
because that snapping out happens all day long. Once I started seeing it enough, I knew that I could count on it. In fact, I call it like, it's, you know, how we call principles, principles for like a reason, like the principle. And to me, snapping out of it is like, like the law of gravity. Like when I go down, I always come up every single time in my life. And I think of every time in my life I've gone down, I come back up. And, you know, gravity, they, they say what, what goes up must come down. Well, with my innate health, when I go down, I come back up every time. Yeah. And I'm not even doing anything. Yeah. It just happened. And, yeah. but the, the, the thing that's helpful is the understanding. It's been happening all, it's been happening all my life. It's been happening all my life, but now that's the understanding part when you see how it works. And that's the freeing, transforming part. So you, when, when you say understanding, the understanding part is that you begin to understand that that's always available. Yeah. I love that you said that, that it's always available to us. It's just a matter of, you know, seeing it or not seeing it in the moment. Mm -hmm. And the understanding piece, I'm assuming you're meaning understanding how these three principles work, mind, thought, and consciousness work to give us, you know, they're just words that explain that we get a human experience through the ability to think stuff up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, um, the story about, about Sid, you know, that like his first, like that big experience he had when he was talking to that, I don't know if every, everyone probably knows it, when he was talking to this person about how insecure he was, and the person said, you're not insecure, you're just, it's just your thought. That, that's like, to me, that's like the famous part of what happened, but he said what happened right after that was he realized that everyone had perfect mental health, but they just didn't know it. And so that's the part for me that I see it is perfect mental health um, because, because that happens, it's, it's almost like, and to me, perfect mental health doesn't mean you don't get, you don't feel hurt. It just means it heals itself automatically every time. And to me, when I come back, like when I realize I'm coming back, it's like the whole slate is wiped clean. Like an etch -a sketch those old etch -a sketches like in that moment, like it's gone, it's gone, it's yeah. past. And that's the exciting part about, um, about this is that it, it's automatic and it just, I can't even put into words how strongly I feel that it's like in that moment, life is absolutely perfect. It's absolutely perfect. The past is gone. The future is not here. And that happens all day long, all day long no matter what's going on, no matter what circumstance is happening. Right. That's really incredible, right? Yeah. When we see that, the yeah. moments that we recognize that. Yeah, and when I saw that, like in a big way, it was what you just said, because I thought my circumstances were, were making me unhappy. And then I realized I was happy, but my circumstances hadn't changed. And that's when I really, I think I really got it. Yeah. You know, and so sometimes when I talk to people now about it, I'll just say something like, you know, have you been ever been upset about something and later felt better, but, but the, the problem hasn't been resolved. And everyone says, yeah, that always happens, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so I, I love this topic, Laurie. I love it. It's because it's so like right on. It's like, it's like the benefit of knowing the three principles is exactly what we're talking about because you realize your own mental health. Yeah. Yeah. That's built in resiliency. Yep. And when you're in the middle of a thought storm, it doesn't look like you'll ever feel that resiliency again. Right. Right? Right. I mean, you're not even thinking about resiliency. You're just right. in the in the eye of the storm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not until you've actually bounced back 
and you're feeling health and well-being again, that you can look back and say, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it so, happens, it happens, that happens every day too. Like you get caught up every day. Like I get caught up probably thousands of times in some some stupid thought. Yeah. You know, some negative thought. I keep telling people like, I don't think I have any less negative thoughts than I used to have, maybe a little bit, but they're so temporary. And you just bounce, like you said, you bounce back from them. It's built in, like built in resilience. And you don't have to worry about, that's the other thing. Like, I don't feel I have to search for something new because I'm still having negative thoughts. I just know they, they take care of themselves and I don't have to search anymore. And isn't that like the, one of the most freeing things when you stop searching for something something new right right yeah yeah very cool right. a, i had i would like to run this experience by you guys and see what you think so just before i apologize my experience is that uh, my soul takes a breath it takes a breath it just goes okay and then i apologize so uh, that's my experience of innate health being stronger than Alan Flood's personal thinking. <laughs> that's my experience of it. So I was I was interested in the experience of it. You know how how different people how different people experience their innate health um, manifesting. Yeah, so how about the rest of you? What's your experience like? How do you know when you've touched base or touched home? Yeah, it feels like touching home base, doesn't it? Yeah, Libby. So after you asked that question, I was thinking about it and I was like, well, what? what does that even mean? Like, what is she even asking? Because I'm kind of trying to learn more about the three P's. And so I like Googled, what does innate health mean? And, and then I Googled, what does innate health mean? And three P's. And, you know, I was like, all day long, I was like, kind of watching a couple of videos and stuff. And, um, you know, to me, it just kind of told me or taught me when I was like reading stuff and watching a couple of videos today that, you know, we all just have this perfect innate health and it's all the stuff, all the circumstances and, you know, all of our thinking of all these things that are occurring that are throwing this off. And, um, you know, we all have this, like, like Tom had just said, we all have this perfect mental health and it's just everything else that's coming in and throwing that off and um you know I kind of understood I kind of like throughout the day kind of was like that makes so much sense to me you know because for me as you know Lori there's all these things that get in get in the middle of my thinking and throw me off and the expectations of different things and so um but then again like like we were just saying that it could change in the next moment or you know like as the day goes on like I'm working or I finish work whatever it just things evolve or um change and then you're back to that original you know perfect thought or whatever so you know it's kind of it's kind of like for me it's just learning how not to let these things come in and interrupt my my well-being if you will you know so yeah i love that you know and it looks like it's things that are interrupting us right it looks like it's the weather or um you know the bill collector or whatever you know whatever the thing is that we would rather not have in our life it looks like it's that thing out there they are outside of us. I mean, when I, when I Googled like the definition of it, I have it right here. It says um, innate health is the idea that all people are inherently whole 
and regardless of the circumstance, genetics, or past experiences, all humans continue to possess the capacity for mental health and well-being. Wow. So it's like we're all like this whole being and then the circumstances and the genetics and all the old history, you know, kind of comes into play. So, I mean, that was helpful for me just to like, what does that mean? And what is the definition? You know, I'm always trying to make some more sense of it. So that was helpful. But yeah, that's perfect that you are curious, you know, curiosity is the best teacher because you'll have a look and reflect and wonder and look inside yourself and see how it works inside you. And yeah, and it made a lot of sense for me, like all these things interrupting my well-being, you know. So. Right. But it's not the things. It's what we're thinking about the things. <laughs> right. Like, have you ever had something come into your life that bugged you and at one point and at another point that same thing happened and it didn't bug you it didn't have the same effect you kind of took it with ease any of you did any of you can you can you call up recall in a time like that I could. Same more. It happens every, uh, you know, over the years of working with various staff, my staff, you know, you have all different abilities. So you have people that, you know, work differently or, you know, I like supervise certain levels of people and they, uh, they don't, they don't listen to you or they don't, you know, they're too busy telling you about their problems at work versus what needs to get done. So you have all different levels of employees and different skill sets. So you, you have to know each person's strength. So, you know, you deal with people that some people don't want to work with. So you, I think I've, I've adapted to each individual employees of mine, personalities and skill set. So, you know, that that's come a long way, right? So when you deal with someone, you have to deal with them this way and, you know, they may do things or say things that uh, make it hard to work with, but then you just, you, you learn to work with it. So you just adapt. So I think that's, that's what makes me a, a good manager that I can work with all kinds of skill set people and all kinds of personalities. So I just, uh, you know, not that I'm perfect, but kind of learn to adapt to negative people that I have to, uh, you know, work under me and have to get work done and I have other people that are more uh accepting and more easy to work with so just every day every day at work you know just my staff especially now on Microsoft Teams you know some people will call you up first thing in the morning and complain about the, the, this but you know that's what's going to happen and you just kind of okay well here's what we're going to do you, you learn to work with different personalities so I guess if that's what you're saying that's how I take it I interpret it as as work versus uh, you know, the real world. And then even, you know, refereeing, I referee high school basketball games. So you have to deal with all kinds of coaches and of really parents. And, you know, so you, you learn to, you learn to deal with different emotions and, and uh, you know, different, different situations and just try to work with all kinds of people. So. So then would you say Jeff, that some of these people, when you first, um, met them and had to work with them they would get to you but over time you realized well what we would call the psychological innocence in people that they're doing the best they can and given how their work life appears to them or given how their life appears to them right everybody's doing the best they can given how things look to them, even though it's off to X degree. So yeah, well, would you I would say that? Yeah, that I would disagree you? with them. 
I would disagree with everybody's doing the best they can because I have some people that kind of checked out and just do the minimum, but you just learn to deal with it. So not everybody, at least in my world where I work, is doing the best they can. So, Well, I'm glad uh, that you pointed that out because let me explain a little more. What I mean by doing the best they can, even the person who's checked out, that is the best they can because they're thinking, I'm done with this, I'm through, I can't handle this anymore, I don't care, whatever the thinking is yep. going on in them that they're not aware of as thinking, they think that's life. That's just yep. life, I'm done. Does this make sense? Yeah. 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 How so, Tom? How does that make sense to you? Well, what what um what I see is that like so, sometimes the statement that people are doing the best they can, like people will will take that a certain way in terms of well, they actually could do better because I've seen them do better. So the way I like to say it is they 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 act based on what they see in the moment as what's what's real and what reality so they're, they're they're acting on what they're seeing basically is, right. is another way of saying it and um, it's the so best yeah. they can do in that moment even though they do way better in other moments yeah because it's because they see things differently like you were so beautifully describing you know what a person's thought process might be if they checked out you know so that's how i see it too yeah. Yeah. and it, it's nice because it it it, it gives me a break because it really doesn't even though judging other people is so much part of our culture it's it's not healthy it doesn't feel good to be like mad and judge in judgment of other people so you give yourself a break if you can see yeah they're they're they're, they're doing things based on their interpretation of reality in the moment you know and the moment could stretch out to a year you right. know yeah. Somebody could just have a really bad attitude for a solid year and not realize that it's coming from inside of them, their own attitude. They think it's coming from all these things outside, you know, yeah. the work culture, the this, the mm -hmm. that, the things they blame it on. Yeah. And, you know, when, when that judgment is not there so much because of what we're talking about, don't you, you find you relate to a person in a totally different way. You could be like in a conflictual situation. But when you understand that you're doing what you can, they're doing what they can, it's it can be a whole different conversation with someone, rather than getting into like a like a fight, because you, you're 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 not judging them. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, and like in Jeff's description of how he sees how to navigate, this is what I heard Jeff say. I don't know, but somehow. I heard him say that he sees how to navigate around different people. To me, that's his innate health and wisdom. He's not letting it get to him that somebody's got an off day or an off year. He just sees how to, okay, listen, and then bring them back to the work that needs to get done, something along that nature. Is that what the rest of you heard too? Yeah, my, my interactions are all work related these days because it's you're not out meeting, you know, new people. Like I can count on maybe one hand over the last year, you know, new people, including you, Lori, obviously, you know, through through meetings that I've met. So it's not like I'm in the environment to meet new people these days. You know, there's not, it's just like, I don't go anywhere. I work from home and I do certain things. So, you know, you meet some people, but you're not meeting nor am I trying to, too. That's another thing. So it's like the group of people I associate with are work, uh, family, and and church, kind of, you know. So that's that's kind of my world these days. You know, it's not out there socially meeting new people actively, uh, you know, daily, weekly. So Now, that could be tricky, too, right? Like, what do you all think about the people you already know? Isn't it so easy to go into our thinking about what they're like, right? Rather than seeing them even. You bring up an interesting um, idea for me, Jeff, that, you know, I think 
we all, you know, I know I do, tend to have these preconceived notions about people in my life. Well, so-and-so is this way, you know? And I love it when I'm more present <laughs> with whoever is with me and I'm not, and I'm not in my preconceptions of how they think and all of that. And I just see a new person in front of me. Because in that moment, we don't really know what they're thinking or how they see things in that moment. See, that's the point I think that too, that Tom, you were bringing out is how things shift moment to moment, not just for us, but everybody out there too. That's the thing about the, the principles that shows us that with each thought, we're in a whole different experience. And you know how thoughts, you know, move through us, sometimes at a rapid pace. <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, sorry, Ellen, didn't mean to cut no, you off. <laughs> I remember Tom saying this sentence in another one of the mystery school meetings that um, when you are talking with somebody, they're giving you new information. You don't know what they're going to say, like before they speak their words, you know, you're getting new information, take it in as new information. Don't act like you already know. And that is so real because now I, every time I catch myself in that um, cycle of like preconceiving what someone's going to say or how they're going to act or whatever, I just, I ground myself and I'm like, they're going to tell me something new. I don't know. I can't read their mind. I don't know what they're going to say. Like I might know this person and how they act and so-and-so, but I'm going to take it as like, you know, this is a new, you know, start of something. I don't know, just an open mind, I guess. And I feel like that, I don't know why it's been stuck in my brain, that sentence, Tom, but that yeah. really, yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. How oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the value of these groups, right? We never know when somebody's going to say something and uh, we get a really cool insight about it. I don't even remember you saying that, Tom, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I, re I remember now it was the uh, the one that we did about listening. That, that uh, was it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Listening to people listening, and yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was That's good. cool. Yeah, I love that. What, Ellen? Um, yeah, so I, I've had a lot of business experience, worked with a lot of people at different levels. And what I, one of the things I've seen is that you can change behavior in the short term by uh, power over, talking, thinking. You know, you can make people change in the short term. But if you want people to change in the long term, you have to trust your own, your own wisdom, the uh, truth of that wisdom. There is such a thing. It is real. It will manifest through your personal thinking uh, when you let it. And then um, act on it. But I 100% agree that sometimes, especially in business, it's hard not to want change immediately. It's hard to not want people to change. And I don't, I don't believe you can make people change in any way that's going to be lasting, or will help you in the long run, or help your business in the long run. Uh, you can draw change out of people. You know, you can, you can talk with them and act with them and treat them in a way that this uh, part of themselves comes to the surface and then you're gonna get the best performance you ever saw in your life. Um, anyway, that's been my experience with in business and working with people. I work in the healthcare industry and man, I see that all the time. You know, there are built-in hierarchies and uh, people at the top of the hierarchy, um, it behooves them to be very careful about how they 
how they work with their uh, cohorts and their other employees because there's this built in sense that they have all this power. And um, in, the long, in the long run, that won't make the organization as uh, caring or as healthy as it can be. Anyway. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad you mentioned that, Alan. That's so true that, you know, there's a way to really, all we can do is be in our own best state of mind. <laughs> That's the best we can do, I think, for the people we work with. That's what I think. You know, if anybody sees it differently, raise your hand. <laughs> um, you know, if the leader is in a understanding state of mind, that's going to tend to draw out the best in the people you're working with. I. Uh, as far as I can tell. That's how it looks to me. And we're not responsible for what went on in that person's day before they got to work. We can't help that. So people have their little attitudes. The trick is not getting triggered by it. Right? I mean, that happens even in friendships and relationships. Easy to get triggered by a person you're close with. And then you wind up bouncing back to innate health and apologizing. I don't know if I ever shared this metaphor in this group, but um, I love the metaphor that it, Dr. Mills, Roger Mills used about a, um, if you take a beach ball and you hold it below the surface in the ocean, and then you take your hands away, that beach ball bobs to the surface right away, really quick. That's, that was how he described innate health. It's always there. It just gets buried under a lot of negative thinking. That's what it is. It's not, it, it doesn't get buried by circumstances. It gets buried by negative thinking about circumstances because the same circumstance can happen two days after somebody has a meltdown over a circumstance and you know they have a bad reaction. Two days later, the same circumstance is happening and they're like, woo woo, you know, no problem. I wish I had an example of that. You know, how one circumstance can be so bothersome. Julia. That's, I, I really never thought of that. You know, I'm with Libby on the whole um, not understanding innate health, like to begin with, like the word. Because when we brought that up, I'm like innate health. Like, I mean, we're, I'm pretty healthy. Like I would think, you know, but I mean, I would say like resiliency, I would put that word to it, but to say that apologizing, like when I would apologize, I thought that was attached to guilt. And I would only apologize if I felt guilty about what I was apologizing for. I would never think that that would be innate health, not in a million years. So like, that's really surprising to me. And actually, I have a confession to make. I um, have not listened to Sid speak at all, not read a book, nothing until two days ago. And now I'm like, what? Like, what? Like, just like mind blown. Because <laughs> what I'd been doing was reading books and listening to podcasts of other people that have listened to Sid or, you know, known him and gone to his conferences. And I was like listening to their version of what they experienced. So I wasn't really even getting the whole picture. I felt like I was, I don't know, I was doing it the hard way, but when I listened to Sid speak, I was like, this makes so much sense because this man is talking about life has a filter on it. 
And I was looking at it through other people's filter and I wasn't even looking at it through my own filter. So now I'm like the past couple of days have been really, really crazy. Uh I was listening to the Hawaii conference and that's like when he talks about religion and, and everything being one. And my family comes from a very real, like I'm, my family is um, Jehovah's witness. Half of my family is. And my immediate family doesn't practice that, doesn't believe in it at all. So to hear that, that this is what it, everything means, I'm like, I, I can't believe it, honestly. You're seeing a lot. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I don't understand innate health completely, but everything else I feel like, yeah, I understand it very well now, makes sense. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so you're getting a lot from listening to Sid's recordings, huh? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't even remember what, you know, I've learned so far, but the little clips are only 20 minutes. And I mean, like, after the clip, I'm like, I need to, I need to tell somebody about this. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense not to, because if someone had told me to listen to it, I wouldn't have listened to it. I did it all on my own and in, in some weird sort of order. And, I, you know, I wouldn't change it. So, <clears throat> You know, Julia, it's interesting because I had a somewhat, somewhat similar experience in that when I was first, it's been about two years, I was listening to all these teachers and then I would listen to Sid in the beginning at least and I didn't get anything. I just thought, here's a really nice man, <laughs> you know. And the thing that struck me about his videos was the audience. You know, they pan out to the audience and, and you see the faces, like they look like they're on drugs or something, you know. They're, they're so happy. But after I went through and saw, had like a transformation, now I go back and listen to Sid and it's totally, it's, it's like, you, like you're saying, it's, that's what it's like now. Maybe that's yeah. it because I listened to Sid in the very beginning and it didn't really click with me. I, I yeah. pictured Sid to be completely different from what he actually looked like. And I think that maybe freaked me out. I thought he was like a six foot, like man, like NBA player type. I don't know. But when I saw him and I heard his accent and everything, I'm like, this is so weird. And this video is so dated. I'm like, this, I got to listen to someone talking about this now, like in real time, you know, I'm a millennial. So, yeah. but no, it's completely different to go back and listen to him after is like, it's, yeah. yeah, different, different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like reading um, Second Chance. First time I read that book, it went right over my head. I thought, well, this is a nice story. <laughs> it takes place in Hawaii. That's a nice fantasy. And um, then years later, I reread the book and uh, whoo, knocked me, knocked me over. Yeah, so glad you said that, Julia. That. Yeah. Yeah, Alan, jump right in. Uh, you know, you guys, you guys know that that I met Sid in 1978, right? Oh no. And, and ever since then, one of the things that has has stuck with me and and come back to me when I've got off track over the years which has just happened is the realness of what he's talking about. You know, Julia, when you were talking about it, there's, he speaks to me in a way, like he said, a living soul talking to a living soul that I had never heard before. You know, I'd never, never experienced anything like that before. And, um, the deep, the deep truth and reality of what he's talking about is, um, it's, well, it's transforming every time I plug in a tape, really. So, uh, you know, I think, I think that's really wonderful that, that he resonates with you. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, you know, 
sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say thank, thank you, Ellen, for saying that because that actually reminded me that the way that I was seeing it was when I was listening to the other people speak about Sid, it, it was like speaking to my mind and my brain. And when I saw Sid, it was my soul, like exactly, exactly how everyone describes. So yeah, that, that was like, that was awesome connection. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. You made the connection, Julia. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? Because Sid's the person who had the experience that uncovered how we experience life as humans through these three principles, mind, thought, and consciousness. And everybody else who learned from Sid, I mean, it's fun listening to them. I like going to the annual conferences and there's one now and I think it's happening oh, the weekend after this weekend. I would say definitely go listen to what they have to say and then come back to Sid, just like Julia discovered. Yeah. Because also when I, you know, like read um, Elsie or Michael Neal or Dick and Bettinger or George Pransky, if I read something or listen to them, it kind of triggers what I have seen from Sid, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's nice having both. But we, right here, meeting like this, we're the, you know, that's what's so great is that we're all students of the principles and listening to or reading what, what Sid found. Yeah. So how did the three principles connect to innate health for you? What is it about the three principles, mind, thought, and consciousness that al allows you to know that innate health, this healthy state of mind is available at any moment? I have a, I have a thought about that. And I don't know if this is in, uh, in line with what other people think about it or not, but you know, for me, the, the three principles I, ex I experienced, the, the three principles are conceptual to me, but I experienced the three principles as gifts that I was given when I was born. So I can use the, you know, the gift of awareness to be aware and the gift of thought to think and the gift of wisdom to, uh, well, that's, that is the gift, I guess. But anyway, that is, so for me, the experience of the three principles has over the years uh, uh, become more about the gift than the uh, concept of the three principles. I mean, is that, Tom, you're nodding your head, is that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's funny, because I was actually out for a walk recently and just those, it, I can't even explain it because I, I, it is conceptual on one level, but I was just kind of feeling it's like, wow, that's all there is. And, and I just saw it in a certain way and I can't even put it in the words. You know what I'm saying? So there's something that I'm hearing in you is, you know, the gift part of it is like the experiential part of it. And you can experience, wow, this is like, a, this is a gift. So yeah. that's, that's kind of what, what I see. I, I don't know if it's making any sense. Yeah, absolutely. That came to me too it, recently on a walk where mm. it, I, I like had this moment of, this is so cool, you know, like, that you can see color and shape and form and without attaching meaning to it, you're just out in nature and um, drinking in beauty and so many different things to look at in nature. I was just blown away, yeah. you know? And 
So yeah, and that, what a gift that I love looking at it that way, Alan. The way I had, and I guess this is also conceptual, but that, you know, we have to do some sort of conceptual explanation to be able to talk to one another. But to me, and I, I love the idea of it, mind, thought, and consciousness being gifts at birth to, that allows us to experience a human life with all its ups and downs and ins and outs and challenges. I see that I was viewing it as though they were a bridge between formless energy and the world of form. So mind, thought, and consciousness is like this invisible bridge where we're bringing formless energy into the world of forms through the gift of thought <laughs> and consciousness. Because, you know, if you had any one of them alone, it wouldn't give you the full human experience, although they are all one. But I do like the way Sid differentiated the words that they all work together for one human experience. <laughs> That's the way I see it. It's funny to try to explain this, isn't it? What you see internally and you try to explain it with words. Does that make sense? Or not really? Not really. <laughs> it's okay. You can tell me if it didn't make sense. It, it does make sense, I think. It's, it makes sense to you. When, they, when they, you break it down so much, what, like how Sid does what he, when he explains the principles and how they work, it almost sounds like a like a science or like a math equation. And I, I don't like to think that much. I like to just keep things simple. And so when he just says in the, in his videos, like, you know, it's just a feeling you don't even try to figure it out. I'm just like, I can do that. I can do yeah. totally do that. And you know, that is like the biggest relief is just the fact that it's not really something that you can sit there and think on because that just makes it complicated and he explains like simplicity and um, complexity. And when you take simplicity, all you're doing is just adding more and more and more things that you don't need and you're making it complex. So that's, I feel like that's a great example because then I was like starting to think too much and I was like, wait a second, <laughs> like, like let, me, let me not get off track. <laughs> yeah. But it yeah. does make sense um, when you do break it down. It just, it's a little bit more work, I think. Yeah, that's great that you sense the difference, like when you start getting too intellectual about it. Yeah. And you know, the trick is just coming back to a quiet, gentle feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm a head guy, right? And I'm a writer and a grant writer, so I'm in my head a lot. And that is a horrible trap. <laughs> I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But the way the way that I reset is to find some version of the feeling love, some version, uh, I look outside and I, I love the, I love the nature I'm seeing. I look at my dog. I love my dog. I look at my wife. I feel great compassion and love for my wife. So to me, that's, that's, that's the potential. That's the potential I have. And the further I get away from that, the further I'm you know, getting away into my own personal thinking and triggers. But that's such a real, such a real uh, uh, a base, uh, a ground that, that I can come back to. And when I put in a SID tape, that's where I go. You know, that's where I go. When I take my dog for a walk, that's where I go. And the point is, the point in doing those things is to get back to that ground again. 
however long I stay there, it doesn't even matter. Just go there, go there, go there. It gets easier. Um, sometimes you lose it entirely, but you always come back, you know? So that's, that's the default for me. So, you know. Yeah, and the default of innate health is the feeling of love. In its simplest form, it doesn't have to be love of someone or something, just that feeling of pure love. To me, that's what innate health feels like. <laughs> we're, feeling, we're feeling it. <laughs> I saw those hearts being flashed. <laughs> how do you, how we do learned you guys, a new trick now. That's so wait, funny. How do, you guys, how do you guys get those hearts up there? That is so cool. Oh, you didn't hear us. That there's this little thing um, yeah, on the bottom yeah. right. It says reactions. Oh it's my something gosh. new that I never saw before. There we go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> this has been such a cool talk. I really like this. Yeah. You yeah. know, I really, it felt deep to me. Did it feel yeah. deep to you guys? Yeah. yeah, I like going deep. Yeah, you know, Laurie, the, I really appreciate the way you you run your, your, your groups. There's a really different quality. I mean, I love everyone who I learn from, but you just have a really nice quality about, you really draw things out of people. And I think you ask people more than other teachers, like what they think. You know, and someone will ask a question and you won't answer it, but you'll ask the group to answer it. And I think that creates a really, it creates a really something that's really nice in these groups with you. And then I get to, I'm really feeling it now, like everyone's contribution. I just feel that yeah. more stronger. So. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. Isn't that cool that, you know, we're all responsible for that. You know, like Libby came with a great question yesterday. So, yeah. And I think this is what Alan referred to when you used to do these groups in Oregon. Is that how it felt back in the late 70s, early 80s? <laughs> I found this tool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was like that, you know, just a sharing of, of what people see, what they don't see, what, you know, just yeah. very uh, authentic and vulnerable. Yeah. Authentic and vulnerable. Yeah, sharing what we all see within ourselves, right? That's really cool. So, well, let's see what what the theme is for next week. And maybe, you know, anybody can come up with a question that you want to ask the group. Ooh, the next one is separate realities. Differentiating between personality and soul, separate realities and differentiating even the separate realities within us. Yeah, Alan, thumbs up. <laughs> so if you come up with a really good question and you want to ask the group, uh, post it in the Facebook group, okay? And, and Laurie, is this, um, I've been a little confused about some of the timing and everything, but is this, yeah, and this time going to go on for yeah. is this for a while? Because this is yeah, a really this seems to be a good time for this people. is a great time for me. The the Wednesday one maybe not so much, but this one is really a good time usually. Cool. Yeah. yeah good. We adjust, you know, with new people coming exactly. in. Somebody's yeah. from you know, I'm trying to fit around somebody who wants to be here um, mm -hmm. from Australia. So that's another oh. time show. I just keep, yeah, but th this seems to be a really popular time. Most people said yay to this time, even though all those people didn't make it today, but they might next week. Yeah. So any last words before we call it a day? Yeah. Thanks for showing up, everybody. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Yeah. Good to see everybody. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Yeah. yeah. Nice meeting everybody. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Bye. Yeah. Bye, everybody.